Hello there ladies and gentlemen, I'm Paul TX141 Walsh, welcoming you to an all new pair of Ace in a Day gameplays for the arcade mode of War Thunder. In today's episode we shall be reviewing, by popular demand, the Messerschmitt BF109 F4 Trop, a German fighter aircraft covered to tier 3 and a battery rated of 3.7. Having already covered the history behind the F4 sub variant of the Messerschmitt 109, as may be seen using the link in the top right corner of your screen as displayed now. Our historical review today is going to focus on two aspects. Firstly, the tropicalization of the F4 sub variant, and also the addition of the Rosetta Irons field conversion kit, outfitting additional armament to the F4 fighter. With that, let's begin. The term TROP, or tropicalized in full, was given to those Luftwaffe aircraft which have been adopted to be suitable for service in desert conditions. The first of the tropicalized F sub variants of the Messerschmitt BF 109 was the F2 TROP which first entered service in Libya in September of 1941. The tropicalizing of an F-2 involved the fitting of a kit to the base aircraft, which included dust filters suited for the larger quantities of dust in the desert, a larger intake for the plane's supercharger, and the addition of desert survival equipment in the cockpit for the pilot. The F-4 would be the second of the F sub variants to be tropicalized, first entering service in North Africa as the F-4 TROP, as depicted on screen today, in the final quarter of 1941. The tropicalizing of the plane involved the same procedure as with the F-2, and would see a total of 576 aircraft tropicalized by the end of June 1942. The next tropicalized subvariant of the Messerschmitt BF-109 was the G-2, which entered service in May of 1942. The F-4 TROP, unlike its non-tropicalized counterpart, was to prove a highly effective fighter against its main adversary in the desert, the P-40 E&F Kitty Hawks, as deployed by the British Royal Air Force. In particular, Oberleutnant Hans-Joachim Marseille was to become the highest scoring Luftwaffe pilot on the Western Front with 158 victories. The majority scored whilst flying an F-4 drop. However, his tally was to be cut short on the 30th of September 1942 when he died whilst bailing out of a Messerschmitt BF-109 G2. With regards to the 15mm heavy machine gun underwing gondola pod as may be fitted to the F-4 and the F-4 drop in game, one of the major contention points regarding the BF-109 F-4 in the eyes of Luftwaffe pilots was whether its nose-mounted armament of two 7.92mm MG-17 machine guns and a single 20mm MG-151 cannon was sufficient. To resolve this, the first of three Rosetta or field conversion kits, known as Rosetta Irons, was conceived and would see the aircraft fitted with two 20mm MG-151 cannon in underwing gondola pods, 120 rounds per cannon. Upon being fitted, the plane was redesignated as the BF-109 F-4 stroke R-1. A total of 240 of these kits were produced by April 1942, and in service, the Rosetta Irons improved the F-4's efficiency as a bomber destroyer, but weakened its handling in one versus one fighter combat, causing the plane to have a greater tendency to experience a pendulum swing in flight. This swing could be compensated for via subtle application of the rudder, but for some pilots this ruined the overall feel of the fighter's control surfaces making it a much more difficult aircraft to fly. Please note, at no point in my research have I been able to find a reference of Rosetta Irons referring to the fitting of two underwing gondola pods consisting of two 15mm MG-151 heavy machine guns. I've only been able to find reference to the 20mm MG-151 cannon armament fitting. With that, and our historic overview concluded, let us take a look at how the Messerschmitt 109 F4 TROP handles in the skies of War Thunder Arcade. Our first gameplay of today takes place on the Grouse Strike map Caucasus. In this gameplay we'll be focusing on the F4 TROP without the 15mm underwing pods attached. For this we'll be using the following setup. Universal belts for our machine guns, the logic being that the Universal belts have been the most potent in my experience, albeit let's not let them distract us from the air target belts for our 20mm cannon which consists in the majority of high explosive and century Munningershoff shells which are absolutely devastating against any given fight in the skies. Our gun convergence is set to 500 meters, realizing that our armament is not affected by our convergence as it's all centerline mounted. And as for our fuel load, we're taking the standard 30 minute fuel load to ensure we can make it to the end of the game, unscaled on fuel capacity. We begin our analysis by quickly pointing out that the statistics I refer to for the F4 drop here are practically the same on the base F4 variant of the BF-109 the two planes are comparable, so I will not be doing a direct comparison of the two aircraft here. What I say for the F-4 drop is pretty much applicable for the F-4. Starting off with the climb rate then, what we can see is at its battery rating, the climb rate of the F-4 drop is not going to be mastered by any other aircraft. 
It may be matched by the likes of the C2L5, C1 or C3 in the long haul. Alternatively, the P6318 King Cobra in the short distance climb race. But in general, there's going to be no plane to surpass this aircraft's climb rate. And that means that you can start off the game by establishing altitude dominance. And we're going to be leveling out at 5,400 meters here, realizing that if we wanted to, we could keep on climbing beyond 6,000 meters. And this gives us options immediately. Who do we want to go for first? And we're going to go for a combination of a heavy fighter and a bomber to demonstrate the very strong energy retention in both the vertical and the horizontal for the F-4 drop. We start off by diving down the Messerschmitt 110. And what we can see is the dive speed acceleration of the F-4 drop is decent initially, whereby you'll be able to accelerate up to 700 km an hour rather rapidly, but as soon as you hit 700 km an hour, your dive speed acceleration drops off dramatically. That means that getting to your maximum dive speed of 924 km an hour takes a considerable period of time. If we close the distance of the Messerschmitt 110 rather easily, then we swung around on the Wellington, using our strong energy retention in the horizontal, we do not bleed too much energy when going through successive turns, I roll into one side, conducting a partial turn, then roll into the other side and turning the other way. You retain your energy well there, and then coming back into the vertical to surge after the P40 Kitty Hawk, we can very quickly saunter after them and catch them by surprise here for what's going to be our third kill. And to put this into a statistical analysis, what you'll find is if you go into a dive at a starting speed of 400 km an hour and a starting altitude of 5,000 meters altitude, dive 2,500 meters, then bring the plane back up to 5,000 meters altitude using engine power alone and a return climb angle of 30 degrees, you will only lose 100 km an hour speed. You will level back out at approximately 300 km an hour. And with one emergency power, you can completely mitigate the energy loss on this plane which means its energy retention in the vertical is absolutely monstrous for the purposes of long and short distance boom and zoom. You'll be hard pressed to find a plane again that can match this in its entirety. And this means that you can start to attack opponents below you without fear of repercussion. Or if you do miss the target, as so long as you don't start flying for a furball that's heading your way, or certainly a large number of planes that are coming out of the enemy spawn, you're not going to be taken apart too easily, because you'll be a very difficult target to pinpoint. But then again, you can always just use the climb rate and your very powerful rudder on this plane to frustrate those who would like to climb after you, cause them to stall out, and then rip them to pieces. Picking up a critical here, and then we'll use the rudder to tighten our turn circle considerably and come around on this F4 chop for another kill. Now, so at this point, we should talk about maneuverability. The turn circle, firstly, of this plane is slightly above average. It's comparable to the likes of your Kovlev Yak 3 when in the ideal speed range of 400 to 600 km an hour. In terms of your control surfaces, your most powerful is your rudder by standard. It's very strong. You've got a decent flat rudder turn circle, although do keep in mind it's nowhere near as comparable to the likes of the Spitfire Mark 5B, or alternatively the A6M2. Your rudder works best when you're using it to improve your natural turn circle, or alternatively conduct maneuvers such as a hammerhead. Your second best control surface is your elevator. It's great within the ideal speed range, and you've got a rather good looping circle. But below 400 km now, you'll find that your looping circle becomes rather drastic and loops actually bleed a lot of speed out of the plane, simply because the plane has difficulty in getting the nose over the apex of the loop and coming back down. As for your roll rate, this is your weakest control surface regard in the fact that your ailerons are comparable to the like of a Spitfire Mark 5B and compared to say a P47 Thunderbolt or a P63 King Cobra, your roll rate is actually quite poor. I mean that when going in for snap rolls, for example, you're going to be a little slow in snap rolling out of the way of the incoming fire compared to the aircraft we've mentioned. This is something to keep in mind, which is why head-to-heads can be a little bit debatable in terms of their efficiency if you get too close to your foe. As long as you have the centerline mounted armament, what you'll find is the durability of the F4 drop is actually going to compromise your head-on capabilities to an extent, because this plane cannot take hits even from heavy machine guns. You'll find that it may only be a couple of bullets that are sprinkled onto your engine deck to cause the engine to burst into flames, and I've had that happen to me a number of times in this plane. Or even then, you may find that the plane starts to fall apart, but it if you take damage to the wing tips, which will compromise your roll rate. If one of your wing tips goes orange, what you'll find is the roll rate down that side of the plane. So, for example, if you take an orange wing tip on the right hand side of the plane, as seen now, your roll rate over that side, so the clockwise roll rate, will be compromised by 50%. And here we're going to push the durability example to the extreme, going after this TBF and not bringing in our cannon until it's too late. This goes to show the dependency on the cannon for bringing down a bomber such as this. And as we took some hits, we can see that our cockpit was heavily damaged, our pilot is wounded to a degree, and because we've lost a bit of control of our pilot being wounded, we're going to have to go into the boom and zoom roll for the rest of this match, or the interceptor roll. So that serves to demonstrate the importance of having your cannon ready to go. 
and on top of that, the durability of this plane is going to be compromised even by a heavy machine gun. A bit of a silly example perhaps, but I just wanted to make it clear. Flammability wise, however, this plane does not catch fire too often, and when it does, it's normally the engine breaking and completely falling to pieces. But that's the less frequent side of the plane in terms of where you're going to pick up the damage. The damage typically comes to the overall fuselage. Now in a high speed situation, what's very nice about this aircraft, and perhaps we haven't articulated it clearly enough yet, is that you only experience a lockup in two control surface domains, your roll rate and your rudder, and the lockup is exactly the same. You will lose 50% of the performance on these control surfaces between 650 and 850 km an hour. I mean, as you push towards your maximum dive speed of 924 km an hour, you're not being punished too heavily for the lockup thresholds. And your elevator experience is no lockup whatsoever, so you have maximum elevator performance regardless of what speed you're doing in a high speed dive. And therefore, you can follow targets quite simply once you get used to the handling characteristics of this plane in the high speed dive. Now here we're having to dive underneath the B-25 to avoid the incoming fire from their rear turret once come up from below where there's a blind spot and in doing so we're going to see the lethal efficiency of the 20mm cannon against this sometimes reasonably durable bomber, just tearing them to pieces for our 8th kill. It is worth noting because you have 200 cannon rounds available, you've got plenty of ammunition and reloads are not going to be too frequent if you are accurate and that's where the centerline mounted of the armament works in your favour because you can really perfect your accuracy in this plane and that also applies to the head-ons as mentioned earlier particularly at the longer distances, opening fire at one and a half kilometers and disengaging around the one kilometer to 800 meter mark. And we go for a reload once again, and now we're going to surge after a Messerschmitt 109 Emil, who's trying to attack off friendly Heinkel 111. Now as we go charging after them, let's talk a little bit about straight line acceleration. And it's a bit odd in the F4 drop, in that from your stall speed of 145 km an hour, which keep in mind is actually at the higher end of your battery rating, so while the higher stall speeds compared to other planes, you'll find that from your stall speed to 300 km an hour you've got a very fast acceleration. But then it drops off to a small extent as you push up towards 400 km an hour, and then it starts to really tail off as you push towards 450 km an hour, and then there's a massive tail off beyond this point. And that means your acceleration goes through stages, and with one emergency power you eliminate all these stages and you can kick your acceleration all up to 550 km an hour. So it means if you really want to build up your speed, you'll need to use more emergency power. But if you don't mind just building up your speed over time, then feel free to just use the raw engine power alone. It's not going to be too difficult. But that's a bit of a weird item on this plane compared to the normal acceleration you get on most planes that you're battering. They accelerate from stall up to a point and then they experience a bleed off. In the F4 chop, there's a number of stages to the straight line acceleration. But that's not to detract from the fact that in a straight line, the energy retention of this plane is not too great whereby you will only get to 630 km an hour in terms of the speed dropping off before you're able to really hold on to your speed. Which means in turn that over time when you're being pursued by someone such as those in a Thunderbolt you'll find they can retain their speed much more easily in a straight line cutaway from a dive and that will leave you at a disadvantage. But then again as mentioned earlier what if your turn circle being above average planes such as the Thunderbolt you'll be able to outturn. So those planes that can outrun you whether it be at higher altitudes or at lower altitudes, you can outturn them, and those planes you can't outturn, you can typically outrun or outclimb and attack by boom and zoom passes. So you've got plenty of tools available to you to deal with the foes you're going to encounter. Now, outside this, as we push for our final potential kill on this B-34, the other items to note on the Messerschmitt 109 F4 drop is that the stall recovery of this plane is average at best. You need to build your speed up to 190 km an hour in order to get this plane back into a responsive state, although do keep in mind it can take a little bit of forcefulness on the elevator in terms of pushing the nose down to get the plane to drop its nose down and build up the speed after a stall. It's not the most rapid of stall regainers by getting the controls back compared to other planes such as a Zero. But outside this, it's a very nice package what we've depicted and hopefully you've seen the flexibility in terms of our ability to choose which tactics we want to employ against our opposition. And as we go to land now, we're just going to bring out the landing flaps and it is worth noting that whilst the landing flaps on this plane deploy very quickly, they take a long time to retract. So if you're going to use your landing flaps in a turn fight, you need to be wary of the fact that they will take a long time to retract and you may find your initial acceleration is very poor and that's because your landing flaps are still in the retraction period. But as we come for our final approach, the game will be coming to its end and it'll be time for us to take a look at the first set of post-game stats.
With our 11 kills, we were able to pick up 40,308 silver lines and 3,996 research points. To defeat the BF109 F4 Trop in a given matchup then, I can recommend one of two approaches. The first approach is to try and force this plane into a low speed turn fight at low altitude, particularly below 300km an hour and below 2000m altitude. The reason for this, and we haven't really talked about it so far, is that the ideal speed range for this aircraft is between 400 and 600 km an hour, and below 400 km an hour, the elevator of this plane in particular becomes rather heavy, particularly below the 300 km an hour mark. Add to this the highest stall speed of standard as 145 km an hour, and this plane is not going to bode well as it goes slower and slower. Then when you go to a low altitude regions, what you'll find is the ideal altitude range for the F4 drop is between 3000 and 5000 meters altitude. But below 3000 meters altitude, there begins a penalty on the engine performance, particularly below 2000 meters altitude in terms of straight line acceleration and climb rate. And this is where you can really start to pick apart the F4 drop in that low speed, low altitude turn fight. And planes such as the LA-5, which naturally do not have as tight a turn circle in the ideal speed range, will be able to turn with the F4 drop, so because the plane's turn circle becomes expanded when it goes into these lower speed regions. Therefore you'll be able to fight the plane on a more equal footing. Just be wary of the F4 drop pilot trying to use their engine power to force you to stall out in the wake via a helical spiral. Option number two is to look for the F4 drop pilot, keep your distance from them, and when they end up focusing very heavily on boom and zooming your allies, particularly around the spawn point, as you can become overconfident in the F4 drop in your energy retention capabilities and your ability to boom and zoom at will, try to attack the F4 drop from above when they least expect you to, and either force them down into a low altitude region where you and your allies can gang up on them, alternatively confront them and rip them out the sky whilst they're focused on one of your allies, simply because the F4 Trop as an individual aircraft can only tackle foes one by one as it only has armoured facing forwards, no armoured in the rear. But by avoiding such circumstances, hopefully so far we've demonstrated the lethality of the F4 Trop and how it can be an extremely powerful and versatile fighter. Well, we have predominantly used it in the boom and zoom and interceptor roles, but if needs be, it can switch into the turn fighter role if needed under certain circumstances. It's at this point that we're going to switch on to a second gameplay which is going to show the F4 Trop with the Rosetta Irons field modification equipped, i.e. the 15mm underwing gondola pods. Our final gameplay for today then takes place on the ground strike map Eastern Europe. We're using the same setup as before, but this time we've added in the secondary weapons of the two 15mm heavy machine guns as mounted in the underwing gondola pods. For these weapons we'll be using the armour target belt, which consists in the majority, i.e. 75%, of armour piercing sentry cement core rounds, which I found are rather effective at setting fires on enemy fighters when we strike fuel tanks, but more so in getting through the thicker skins and armour of the more durable enemy bombers, whereby these rounds will pass through fighters fuselages unless they hit a hard point such as the fuel tanks or the engines, but against bombers because they've got the greater overall fuselage size the rounds can go in and do considerable damage over time. Our gun convergence of 500 meters will affect our wing mounted pods and we're keeping to 500 meter gun convergence as we find when intercepting an enemy bomber will typically open fire from 1000 to 800 meters distance and try to close in for the kill around the 500 meter mark so we're maximizing our damage output with our wing mounted pods at our convergence bringing the bomber apart before we get too close. And as we climb to altitude what we're going to be pointing out over the course of this comparison i pods or no pods is where we've got differences in behaviour either in our playstyle or the plane itself. Now straight away what you can see is there's no difference in behaviour in the opening strategy. Use the superb climb rate of the plane which is not affected by the pod mounting in order to get above our opposition or put ourselves in an ideal position to be confrontational. And here we'll need to go head to head with a P-51 D5 Mustang who's been climbing towards us but they're a little bit underneath us. We have the energy advantage and we'll try to cut them down in the head to head but here we only pick up a hit so we'll snap right out the way of their incoming Browning machine gun fire making sure not to take too much of it, simply because we do not have the durability to hold up to it in the long term. We carry our momentum through, picking up an assist on the Mustang, and we'll go for the KI-61 here, dodging the head on at last moment and picking up damage to their cooling system. We hammer head over the top of the target here, and we do so in the standard fashion, where there's no impact to our control surfaces in our ideal speed range of 400 to 600 km an hour across all three control surface domains, and we carry through to pick up a double kill here, ripping apart the P-39N0 Aero Cobra. Now in that instance we saw that the Ki-61 burst into flames well before they fell out of the sky and that was because of the incendiary component on the 15mm heavy machine gun rounds I personally feel. And that's one thing to keep in mind, you do have a higher chance of setting foes on fire with these rounds equipped. 
but besides that the overall impact what's going to be the knockout blow if the fire is not enough will be your 20 mm cannon still as it has the high explosive and essentially mining the shot shells so we're not taking away anything from the cannon armament instead we're adding to it by adding an incendiary component now outside of that what is also worth noting now is the fact that because you have 250 heavy machine gun rounds available this is a nice thing to have because you do not have to worry about your 15mm heavy machine gun being exhausted at the same time as your 20mm cannon with its 200 rounds. The heavy machine gun will be exhausted first because each heavy machine gun has 125 rounds available. And that means you'll have approximately 40 cannon rounds left by the time you go for the heavy machine gun reload, meaning that you've still got ample firepower to bear on and off of the reload cycle. So you're not going to get caught out unless you force a reload using what is standard in Wolf Under the Y key, if I remember correctly. Now as we're sauntering about the skies here, getting some distance from the enemy spawn and heading back over to counter the threats that have started to climb out of it, what we've seen is that our straight line acceleration is not impacted in any way, and it will be the same in terms of our dive speed acceleration, but what is impacted however is our dive speed maximum, whereas before it was 924km an hour, it's now dropped to 919km an hour. Not too much of an impact, simply because getting to your maximum dive speed in this plane takes a very long time, it's onerous and we talked about that earlier. But it is something to keep in mind that in those extreme dives when you're trying to get away from someone up at say 6,000 meters altitude, they may be able to catch up to you a little bit sooner because you'll hit your dive speed maximum sooner. Now what has been impacted by the addition of the pod is your energy retention in all three domains. In the vertical firstly, remember earlier we gave the example of going down from 5,000 meters altitude and a starting speed of 400 km an hour, going dead vertical down to 2,500 meters altitude and then climbing back up to 5,000 meters altitude at a 30 degree return climb angle. Whereas before you'd level out and lose 100 km an hour of your starting speed, in the case of having the pods equipped, you'll lose an additional 30 km an hour. Now this isn't too much of an impact, this is still absolutely admirable by comparison with your battery rating contemporaries, but you do have to keep in mind you have sacrificed a bit of vertical energy retention, but here it hasn't hurt us, we've been able to charge after the B-34, and we're going through to this AR-2 now, and we can see how the 15mm machine gun rounds are allowing us to do considerably more damage at distance, and as we close in, we can really start to have a massive impact with our cannon and our machine guns combined. And that means bringing down bombers is a lot easier with the addition of the pods. Albeit you only need a couple of good 20mm cannon shells, as we did show previously in the right places, to bring down the likes of B-25. So you could question the addition of the pods making things exactly easier or how easier it makes things. Now one other thing to note is you have no impact to your maximum altitude performance but at the same time we didn't really talk about it in the first gameplay. The maximum altitude limit on this plane is 5,500 meters altitude for the engine performance above which your straight line acceleration is severely impacted and at 6,000 meters altitude you'll find that your control surfaces start to drop off massively especially in terms of your elevator where to do a loop or conduct a tight turn, you'll need a starting speed of 500 km an hour. This is not impacted at all when you have the pods equipped, although do keep in mind that your ideal speed range up at higher altitudes, whereas it would now be 500 km an hour without the pods, it is pushed to say 525 km an hour to keep the plane stable at such a high altitude. And this is important, because what you perhaps haven't been noticing as much over the course of this gameplay, but now I've pointed out you may notice it a little bit more, is that in like in the historical overview, the addition of the pods actually causes a little bit of sway on this plane, or lack of stability, when trying to point the nose in a particular direction in a very quick instant. Whereas before you could be pinpoint with this aircraft, now you do have a little bit of side to side wobble because of the addition of the pods. And if you compensate for this, you set up your engagements correctly, it's not going to be a problem, you'll still have ample time on target and be able to take the target down accurately. And that's what I've been having to do over the course of this gameplay. I've had to adjust to give myself more time on target and make sure I retain my accuracy in bringing my foes down. And if you don't compensate for this, you can start to get a little bit frustrated with the F4 drop with the pods attached. And we can see that here against the LA-5F. I'm setting up exactly where I want them so I've got ample time to use all the firepower to bear and eliminate any potential wobble as I've now got the Ki-61 trying to climb up after me and an Aerocobra that's considerably closer but they're not going to match me for my climb or energy retention in the vertical as I break away. Now other aspects of energy retention, let's talk about the horizontal. There is a minor impact on your ability to maintain your energy through successive turns. It's not too much, but you will feel it there, and you do lose out a little bit as you go into those extended turn fights. But most importantly, it's in a straight line. Whereas before, you really start to hold your speed around the 630 km an hour mark without the pods, now it drops to the 600 km an hour mark. This is a considerable penalty when you're trying to run away from an opponent after coming out of a dive in a straight line. 
whereas a good number of phones will now be able to retain their speed a lot more easily in excess of 600 km an hour compared to yourself, where you'll be starting to retain your energy at the 600 km an hour mark. And going for a reload here and getting above our opposition once again. What about high speed controllability? Well, you still have the 650 to 850 km an hour penalty markers, either 50% lockup on both the rudder and the ailerons. You have no penalty to your elevator once again, so that's nothing to worry about, and nothing's changed there. Train line acceleration, as mentioned previously, is the same. Stall speed, however, has been impacted along with stall recovery. Now, your stall speed was originally 145 km an hour, it's now 150 km an hour. Again, nothing major, but it's something to keep in mind. And as for stall recovery, it's average still. It takes a little bit longer to get the nose down, and you'll need to get your speed up to 200 km an hour now, rather than 190 km an hour, so a 10 km an hour penalty, in order to start getting the control surfaces back in this plane and be able to start flying the plane as normal, or at least start building up speed properly to get the plane back into a comfortable state. Now here as we go into a high speed dive after a number of targets, we can't really hit the flock off because they're going too fast and we're not going to be able to catch them at a rapid enough rate. So instead we decide to look towards the KI-61, fainting towards the Messerschmitt 19 at first. We go for the head to head, but we bow out at the last moment because what we're worth is the fact that we only need to take a couple of hits to our engine for the engine to be severely damaged potentially. As mentioned earlier, so we're not going to run that risk. Instead we'll just pull our distance for our energy retention and then surge back in for another boom and zoom pass when the time is right. But apart from the mention of the lack of stability compared to the non-pod iteration nothing has really changed in terms of our playstyle here we're still enacting the standard boom and zoom runs we may want to go into a turn flight when we think the situation is right and we can go for the interceptor on enemy bombers and perhaps we can be a little bit more efficient in dealing with enemy bombers because of the additional firepower i.e. the additional burst mass as a result so nothing's really changed although there are some minor changes but you can compensate for them as mentioned as we pick up our eight and final kill of this gameplay and surge out into the distance. I'm just going through my notes, there's nothing else to add. The only thing that should be noted is that there's a significant difference of the muzzle velocity of the armor piercing incendiary cement core rounds coming in at 1020 meters per second in game compared to the high explosive incendiary mining shots rounds in your 20mm cannon at 785 meters per second and for your 7.92mm machine gun rounds they're in the region of 900 meters per second so you now do have three stages of muzzle velocity for your firepower and you'll need to get used to leading this at longer distances i say from 600 meters out to a kilometer if not further but if you can keep your opponents in a straight line or get them to stall out where they have very little speed and therefore do not require too much lead then you're not going to have as much difficulty we were looking at that yak nine but i see hurricane did a good job of taking them out so instead we're just going to keep our distance from the main furball that's coming in and go above the enemy team, seeing as they're trying to charge up towards us, and we'll swing down when the time is right once again. Same tactics as we normally use as the game comes to its end, and it's time for us to take a look at the post-game stats. With our 8 kills and single assist, we're able to pick up 24,753 silver lines and 2,412 research points. To defeat the F4 chop with the pods equipped, I'd recommend the same approaches as when this plane does not have the pods equipped, simply because the changes to the aircraft's flight characteristics are not too noticeable to affect a change in approach. The only difference is in the low speed low altitude turn flight, the F4 chop pilot, with the increased instability of the plane in such circumstances with the pods equipped, will have to put in additional effort to get the plane to go from one manoeuvre to the next, normally affording you an additional half a second to be able to react to them and conduct your own manoeuvres to get onto their six, so it will give you a small advantage but nothing major in terms of your approach. But by avoiding those circumstances, I guess we have to come on to our final question of the day, would I recommend flying this plane with or without the pods? To be honest, it's up to personal preference. For me, I fly the plane without the pods equipped typically, simply because I prefer the natural feel of the control surfaces of this aircraft, and I think the pods take away from that to some extent. On top of that, I feel I can get the job done with the single 20mm cannon, rather than needing the additional 15mm heavy machine guns to bolster the firepower to bring down the bombers in particular. I think that if you set up your approaches right, the 20mm cannon will be able to make short work of anything you encounter, even the strongest bombers, around your batter rating range. But again, it comes down to personal preference, and the 15mm heavy machine guns are a nice bolster in bringing down bombers if you feel you don't have the confidence to just rely on the 20mm cannon to get the job done. But regardless, the F4 Trop in general is an extremely powerful fighter aircraft for its batter rating and tier, whereby it has the ability to take on practically any circumstance so long as the pilot is aware of the strengths of the aircraft and the relative strengths and weaknesses of their opponent. 
they can choose to conduct boom and zoom, turn fight within their ideal speed range, or alternatively go for head-ons being aware of the durability of this aircraft and come out on top. And if anything, when flying this plane, you'll feel just like Marseille, because the F4 chop, in my opinion, is the star of Africa and one of the strongest planes in the game at the moment for its given battle rating. And so I've been TX141, and if you have enjoyed this video, why not leave a like, comment, or subscribe for future War Thunder videos on my channel. But until next time, as always, ladies and gentlemen, take care, and good luck in the skies. Thank you.